दिस इज भारत एफ एम बजेगा भारत झूमेगा भारत ये है भारत एफ एम बजेगा भारत झूमेगा भारत गुड मॉर्निंग यूएसए गुड इवनिंग इंडिया टूडे वी आर येट अगेन विथ भारत एफ एम सो कनेक्ट फॉर कॉल्स वी हैव टू स्पेशल गेस्ट टूडे वन यू ऑलरेडी नो प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ यू आई फॉर्मर एडवाइजर ऑन ह्यूमन ट्राफिकिंग व्हाइट हाउस अपॉइंटेड बाय प्रेसिडेंट ओबामा एंड री अपॉइंटेड बाय प्रेसिडेंट ट्रम्प मिस्टर डिसूजा Mr Disuja runs an NGO called Eyes Open International EOI EOI is a non-profit focused on combating human trafficking through empowerment and education globally Welcome Disuja sir Thank you Ridhi Thank you Our second guest of the day is Dr Lara Dr Lara Wilkin DNP RN assistant clinical professor Lara Wilkin is an assistant clinical professor and coordinator of the online rn bsn program at bowling green state university she recently earned her doctorate of nursing practice with a focus on healthcare and human trafficking her background in nursing is primarily medical surgical oncology with experience in public school nursing and sexual assault nurse examiner she has spent the last 8 years donating much of her free time educating healthcare providers on the assessment and identification of those involved in the life of human trafficking Welcome, Dr. Lara, to Bharat FM. We are very happy and proud to host you today, Dr. Lara. As we read your bio right now, we have seen that you are all the academics has been focused only on human trafficking. So, can you just explain that when did you start reading about human trafficking or getting understood yourself about human trafficking, and you wish to pursue that? Yes, I want to pursue my career into human trafficking. What was that point? How did this journey got started? Wonderful. Thank you so much. So, um, just to recap, you wanted me to talk about how I've been involved with human trafficking and and how my passion came to be. So, um, you know, it's it's really interesting because my my journey in both nursing and education began about probably ten years ago, and I started educating healthcare providers on the assessment and identification of victims probably about eight years ago. And part of the reason why I became so inspired to be so passionate about this cause was because it was something that I was seeing that it was mind-boggling to me that we as healthcare providers, you know, we see parts of people that they don't want us to see, and we see parts of people that we don't necessarily want to see, but it's our job to look. And somehow, when it comes to human trafficking, we're missing our mark. Um, in the research that I've done, I have found that nearly 87% of victims who have been recovered from the life stated that during their time of captivity, they were seen and treated by a healthcare provider and human trafficking was never identified. Nearly 87%. And it just baffled me. How is it possible number one, that we are seeing these people, but we're not identifying them. And then number two, the other thing that really inspired me to become passionate and wanting to learn more about human trafficking is that we live in the United States, the land of the free. So how is it possible that there are people enslaved before us? So when I started to you know, learn about all of these things, I just couldn't get enough. I, I needed to find everything that I could out there between what was in the literature and talking with survivors and figuring out a way that we can help healthcare providers become more aware of the red flags of human trafficking, how to appropriately advocate for and provide intervention for individuals who are in need. And just to get back to the very basics of nursing, which is the foundation for caring. Because when it comes to human trafficking, essentially that's what these individuals need, is someone to care for them. And as healthcare providers, that is our calling and it is our job. That's a very good answer. So we all are uh, shocked right now that 87% of the people in human trafficking 
have not been assessed or identified as the human trafficking victim by the health care providers so education is very much important and we are very glad that what you are doing right now so my question is based on this that when a patient enters into a hospital or when it is been registered as a patient in your hospital that what sign you see in him or her as a victim of human trafficking what is what you see at the first glance well you know it's it's really interesting i think part of the reason why we're missing these individuals is that there really is no one indicator that you're going to see. And that's why it makes the identification so challenging. And the other challenges that we face as healthcare providers are the fact that we are in such a high um, a high paced, fast paced environment, you know, where we're trying to multitask and we're trying to take care of so many people at once. And obviously with COVID-19, we know that that has even increased um, the workload of our providers. So um, providing education on some of the most common red flag indicators to answer your question would be that, you know, the patient cannot come and go as he or she pleases. There is someone that is speaking for them. That is why it is so incredible incredibly important that healthcare providers advocate for and use appropriate translators in the clinical setting. Other indicators might be that there's a suspicious person with the individual, or maybe the individual um, exhibits signs of uh, substance abuse or physical abuse, um, sexual assault, mental health issues. Some of these things um, are we see on a day-to-day -day basis, but then we don't make the connection because we don't have the understanding standing in education that may be the reason why this individual is experiencing mental health issues such as anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder is because of the life that they're involved in. You know, um, we as healthcare providers, it is our job to advocate for our patients. It is our job to treat our patients. And we do a phenomenal job at fixing the immediate problem, but we need to look at the entire patient as a whole. We need to not only assess the patient, but we also need to assess who is this individual with in a clinical setting? And, and what where where are they from? What is what are their stories? You know, do they know where they where they are? Where they live? Um, who are they living with? Do we know um, do they have control over their identification and their personal documents or someone holding them? So these are some of the common red flag indicators. Um, my, the education I provide goes um, way more in depth, but those are some of the most um, prominent ones. And the key to identification is looking holistically at the patients and making sure that you have the time. And if you don't have the time, advocating to get someone in there who does have the time to recognize these red flags. Yes, that's a very good answer. So as you mentioned about COVID, we have seen that in COVID, all of them has been working virtually. And we also seen that there has been rise in human trafficking cases the traffickers are operating virtually and uh, uh, fooling the victims and trapping them into their uh, human trafficking, what you can say, that uh, trap. So have you got many patients of human trafficking victims in your hospital after COVID or it is the same? What is the ratio? So, you know, it's really interesting that you asked that question um, because, well, first of all, let me, can I give you a little bit of background on my, on myself and, and, and a little bit about what I do and, um, and that'll kind of give you insight into um, my connection with the healthcare organizations. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So um, currently right now, I'm a professor for Bowling Green State University. I am the coordinator of the online RN to BSN program. I am very proud to state that every nurse that goes through our program does receive um, education on human trafficking in two of our courses. So every BSN graduate that comes through will have received education on this content. So that's really exciting. Um, that's how we are going to truly combat this problem. Now, just because of the fact that I um, am no longer actually in the clinical setting, 
I still work directly with my local healthcare organization. And so I'm very fortunate and blessed that I have the support not only of my local healthcare organization, but of my community in helping healthcare providers identify this issue. So one of the things that I've currently been working on is I have created an algorithm for our local emergency room um, for our registered nurses. And I've also been working on the development of our healthcare policy. And um, in doing so, other things that I have done is I've created resource cards for safe house shelters. And I'm really proud to state that since we have um, implemented some of these things, I have been informed that there have been victims that have reached out. So um, I can't give you an actual number, but um, whenever uh, someone hears that there's a connection to the work that I've been doing with our local task force and with our local healthcare organization, they let me know. And we are being able to provide intervention for these individuals. Um, so it's a really exciting time, that not only with the work that's being done in healthcare, but also in our local community and the surrounding communities that are willing to help. And another thing I'd like to add too, if you don't mind, is that uh, all of the work that I have been doing is survivor informed. And I think that that's really important because, you know, we, we can learn so much from the literature. We can learn so much from what other healthcare organizations have seen and um, individuals that they've cared for, what they've encountered. But I really think that it is important that through the work that we do, that we tell the narrative of those who have experienced this, because they are the ones who are able to say firsthand, you know, yes, this would have helped me or no, that is not going to help me. And so um, that's one of the things I've been working really hard on right now is trying to get that um, survivor informed feedback and input to ensure that we are actually meeting the needs of both labor and sex trafficking victims. So what you said is absolutely right, because I agree with you as Errol D'Souza himself is a survivor. And this is because Eyes Open International is doing fantastic because he got the ground level knowledge what the victims have gone through and also that is the reason he was appointed at the White House. So how did you get connected to Mr. D'Souza and what is your association with Eyes Open International? So that's a really great question. And before I get into that, I would like to just first say that, um, and I may get tearful, um, it is such a privilege and an honor to not only collaborate with Eyes Open International, but to honestly call Harold my friend. Um, he, I feel as though we, I just said this before we jumped on here, I feel as though we've known each other our whole lives. And, um, and it is, it is truly, it has truly been a blessing to work with him. And I have learned so much just through his experience on human trafficking. But to, to specifically answer your, your question, um, how I ended up becoming um, connected with him was I had attended pre-COVID uh, the Ohio Attorney General's um, uh, Human Trafficking Summit. And at that presentation, his wife had spoke about their experience with labor trafficking. And I was so incredibly moved by her story. And I learned so much from her just in that, in that time period of seeing her present on things that I knew would help impact the work that I was doing. So afterwards I had approached her and I said, you know, I have learned so much from you and I, I really want to work to create intervention for individuals that will be effective in the healthcare setting. May I contact you? So she had given me her email address and um, I was so busy with well, obviously we had COVID-19 and then also pursuing my doctorate. And then once things started to settle down, I had the opportunity to reach out to both her who and Harold. And since then, they have been so kind to me. They have been so helpful and so informative. And I'm very proud to call them my friends. And it is an honor to be here today to represent Eyes Open International. Thanks a lot, Lara. So, Mr. D'Souza, I want to ask you, how, when you met Dr. Lara, what was your thought? 
that uh, what would you collaborate with her about eyes open international or what are your future projects or how are you currently working together i, I think first of all i have to thank uh, dr lara to be on our show of eyes open international i think it's being viewed globally and uh, dr lara i think today you are educating and empowering lot of uh, community members globally and that's uh, very good so i would just want to thank you for uh, doing this the most important uh, question uh, riday is that i think the first time i spoke to dr lara over the phone and i could just visualize that this is a koino or a pure diamond <laughs> you know so and i think our conversation went on for almost 45 minutes because she was doing some project on the hospital on the healthcare and how to identify red, red flags and uh, i also like become very emotional <laughs> talking to her and i shared a lot of informations with her and i know that she became very emotional she she and cried on the phone and that is how our, it took off you know and uh, i think just couple of weeks back we met she came to cincinnati and uh, she uh, she met my wife and uh, she vi visited my house so i i always believe that i always believe you know like a team work makes the dream work you know so it's not about me you know it's not about you riday or all of us but we all together everybody every drop matters and that's what i feel and like i always believe in one thing that eyes open international is your organization is our organization and it is not my organization you know so that is what we are trying to accomplish so that if we can of victims survivors community members and a uh, vulnerable population globally i know i think that is what you want and like what dr lara said i am quite amazed and people might be shocked that 87% yes. of the victims of human trafficking whether it is labor trafficking or sex trafficking goes through this channel that is the hospital and which is a fact i myself went to the hospital so many times and i always feel i and create education in the hospital that in my case or in many cases a victim could have been rescued at a very early stage and i really command and salute you so uh, uh, dr lara you know for what you are doing and before i end i just want to tell the seven c's of you you know you are cool you are caring you are compassionate <laughs> you are creative you are charming <laughs> and you are here to change the world you know number 6 and 7th the most important that you are a thorough community member so thank you very much so here out of the box i would like to say that it's uh, today's uh, mr disuza's father's birthday and also a film is coming on him on harold disuza and the producer said dedicated this film to mr disuza's father honorable henry disuza So, sir, what is this film about, and how are you feeling about it? Wow, you you touch my heart, uh, Riday. And uh, uh, today is a very auspicious day for me. I'll be very honest. Uh, September 18th is my father's birthday. Uh, we were good friends. He was my mentor. Uh, he motivated me. He inspired me. I was a failure as a childhood. You know, I failed in all the subject. I was good for nothing. I was a trash can. that is what was told by all my other family members and community members but it was my dad who always inspired me and said that come on you can do something in life and which i never believed but it is a reality that uh, today i got to go to the white house and uh, i think it's uh, god's blessing and my father's blessing i lost my dad 20 years back but i still believe uh, riday and dr lara that my dad still lives in me or i live for him and it's a blessing that the there is a biopic uh, blockbuster silver screen movie coming up at an international level and it's a very it's at a very big exposure which i myself am totally amazed and things are moving very fast the script writing like i am on like zoom calls for a couple of hours in a week and uh, i am quite touched by the way they are uh, creating and developing this movie you know i have certain uh, rights like you know the like i have signed the life right agreement so i am not in a position to share every information of the movie but uh, riday uh, i am quite touched that the film producers 
the directors or the entire crew members of the team which is globally you know it's a international team you know based in bombay i think in different countries i don't to name the countries but they happily agreed to dedicate this movie in in the loving memory of uh, my father that's henry de souza and i'm i'm uh, i'm really very that that is something that inspired me or gives me more motivation for this uh, particular film you know and i just want to share that little bit of the movie is that they done it in a very very unique and professional way i think it's 90 it's all it's all reality the role of mine will be done by some professional it's not me i'm not in the movie but they may show something in the end or i don't know how it works so there's a professional actor uh, who is going to do it but the end i always told them like you know anyone who watches that movie whether it is a broken relationship unemployment pandemic you know labor trafficking sex trafficking you are having very ill health and when million people quit so, but i i want like when people watch that movie they should come out and think that come on i can make this happen i can do it if i can do it why can't you do it that is my overall goal uh, riday so thank you very much uh, riday and dr lara I appreciate that yeah i'm sure that this movie will be a blockbuster hit so dr lara coming to you, when i was researching about you i find out that uh, you have been a college dropout and after dropping out from college you have achieved so many things so what was your inspiration then after dropping out from college and achieving so many things thank you so much for asking me you know um <clears throat> it's interesting because one of the things that i think really inspired me to become so passionate about human trafficking is that the individuals who i've encountered and they're such beautiful people um both from sex trafficking and labor trafficking they they share this this um they share this sentiment with me like Harold just described when he was describing himself and saying how at one point you know in his life he had felt that he had failed or he hadn't succeeded and um you know my story is uh is actually that I I quit school when I was in I mean I went for the ninth grade but I don't really think that that grade counted so I always say I quit school in the eighth grade um and then I ended up trying to continue my education in Cleveland and it just didn't work out. I fell in with the wrong crowd and I was in a really dark place in my life and I had just kind of given up hope on myself and and kind of on everything and um you know I ended up moving there at a young age and I was fortunate enough that my mom's boyfriend at the time he checked on me every day. Every day he would call me and ask me, you know, where where was I? How was I doing? What was going on? Who was I with? And, you know, he he brought me home. It it took probably about close to 3 years, but he ended up bringing me home and so you'll often hear me say and and I I put this when I put the promotion out for this um this this interview today, you'll often hear me say that we can never underestimate the power of a planted seed. and i feel like you know another thing that harold had said and this goes correlates very well with both human trafficking and it correlates very well with um just my experience in general is that it it does take a community it it truly does when we talk about you know he my mom's boyfriend planted that initial seed in me but it took a network of individuals to help me to succeed and a lot of people will say to me oh my gosh you know here you are you know you're a high school dropout and now you have your doctorate of nursing practice you know you're such an inspiration and i appreciate those kind words but what i care to share with others is that the true inspiration in my story comes from the people who invested in me and um I'm sorry sometimes I get a little emotional um but I I walked into Bowling Green State University when I was 29 years old um I was around 20 21 or 22 when I 
um, pursued my GED. I remember I would, I didn't tell anyone because I was so afraid of being that failure. You know, I was so afraid of, of the things that Harold described about himself. I felt about myself and I was embarrassed to tell people I was a high school dropout and I hid it from people for several years. Um, and, and then I snuck, you know, every night to go to my night classes for my GED. And then once I passed, I, I let my family know, but it was then, um, when I was 29 years old, around that age, that I decided to go back to nursing school. And I walked into Bowling Green State University. And on that day, I met with the late John Clark. And I said to him, I only have an eighth grade education, but I would like to be a nurse. Can you help me? Yeah, of course. And <clears throat> on that day, he looked at me and he said, yes, I can. Three words that completely changed my life. He could have looked at me and he could have said, you've never even taken a science class. You've never even taken a math class. Or he could have said to me, do you know how hard nursing school is? This is not going to be easy for you. But on that day, he said, yes, I can. And so it was with the, um, the love, the compassion, the commitment, the um, the, the belief, the belief in me that I didn't have in myself, the belief that I still struggle with today. Many times today, I sit with these individuals with these prestige, you know, credentials and, um, and I sit with, you know, the dean of the college and, and they're all beautiful, wonderful people. But I, sometimes I question, do I, do I really belong here? <laughs> because a lot of times I still feel like that eighth grader, that eighth grade kid in my head. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's so amazing what a community can do when they come together. And so it was with, you know, the, um, the individuals that have helped me to be where I am. So I would like to say that um, my boss now um, at Bowling Green State University was actually my teacher in nursing school. So she was my teacher in nursing school. And then after I received my bachelor's degree from Bowling Green, I took a position um, at my former school of nursing, which was Firelands um, Regional Medical Center School of Nursing, where she became my colleague and my mentor. And now she is my boss at Bowling Green. So I literally walked into Bowling Green State University with only an eighth grade education. And now I am back there as the coordinator of the online RN to BSN program as a professor who just recently earned her doctorate in um, December of 2020. So the reason I tell you that is because it was very full circle for me. And it was all of those people that helped me between family members and um the teachers and just people who never gave up on me. And that's that's why I truly believe in the work that I do with human trafficking, because we can never underestimate the power of a planted seed. And when Harold talks about how, you know, he says, Eisner and Open International is my organization, it's his organization, it's your organization. The same can be said with the work with human trafficking. You know, we cannot work in silos. We have to come together to meet the unique needs of this vulnerable population because these individuals need so many different things. It's not just the healthcare intervention. The healthcare can be the first point in identification, but then it's the mental health needs. It's the social needs. It's the empowering these individuals to know that, you know, anybody has the potential to be anything if they have a dream. And it is providing these intervent these individuals this trauma informed care that takes a community to come together. And like I said, I'm very fortunate. I'm part of the Erie County Human Trafficking Task Force, and I'm co chair of that organization with Tracy McGinley, who's the head of criminal justice at Bowling Green. She is our chair. And then Sarah Reynolds, who is the head of um, victims advocacy, is our other co-chair. And together we have come together to unite our community and how can we meet these individuals' needs. Dr. Lara, it's never too late and we are very proud of you that you are now an inspiration for many. And also you are sharing that what you have gone through, which will 
people understand, people can connect this story to themselves that yes, I can do now, no matter what has happened in my past, now I can be thriving fully. So Dr. Larry, you're doing an amazing job. Thank you for that. I just want to add uh, one thing. Uh, sorry, Riday. I just want oh. to add, you know, like Dr. Lara, you know, we and all our community members globally uh, respect your feelings, emotions and sentiments. So having tears of happiness is good because I can see those tears are of happiness and not of hurt. So you have transferred those tears from hurt to happiness. And that is what we all need to understand that, you know, everything is possible. I always tell, I do not believe in impossible. I believe I am possible. And that is what you have shown it to the world. So thank you very much. So yes, Dr. Larry, yeah, in the beginning, we talked about the science of human trafficking. Now, can you just explain or educate our audience about once you have identified the victims of human trafficking in your hospital, then what are the next steps? Do you inform the police or any NGO or something about it? Or is there any special treatment for the victims of human trafficking? How the how is the process? That's a really great question. And part of the, the answer to that question is, again, making sure that, you know, we are creating a safe environment and we are taking the time. You know, we talked a lot about how, I mean, some of the, I, I have worked with some of the most incredible nurses and doctors that I have ever met in my entire life. And I would allow them to take care of me in my darkest hour and, and in my greatest needs. Um, but I also know the constraints that no matter how great of a nurse or a doctor that you are, the constraints that you can feel in a very fast paced um, medical environment that is serving a multitude of individuals with complex needs. And so, um, you know, the, the, the key to, to assisting these individuals is to making sure that you have the time to talk with them alone. And in doing so, meeting these individuals where they are at. You know, we need to, as a culture, look more closely at our patients holistically. Um, part of the reason why I share my story about my experience in terms of the hardships I've had in my life is because when people look at me, when I provide my lectures and people look at me, they see these polished credentials, right? They see the white lab coat and, and, and there, there's a picture of me that people don't see. And so whenever I, I educate healthcare providers, the number one thing that I say to them is to continuously, always, always look once, look again, and most importantly, look for the picture that you don't see. And in order to see that picture, we have got to take the time. We have got to separate these individuals. We need to advocate for them by having an interpreter. And we need to use a trauma-informed approach. You know, every single person that experiences trauma responds to it differently. The, the neurological response to trauma can manifest can manifest in various different ways and and sometimes people aren't going to present as what we would think they would present and that's okay and so we need to meet them where they're at in that moment and we need to consider what is the most effective thing that i can do or say for, to this person in this moment in the event that they are a consenting adult and they don't want help at this time. Maybe they don't, maybe they know that right now is not a good time to get help. And if that is the case, they're not in imminent danger. They know that it's not a good time to get help and they're not ready. We need to do our part to respect the no, but at the same time, we need to respect the individual by providing them trauma-informed care, by showing them compassion and kindness, and by meeting the needs that we can meet in that moment. You know, um, when you talk about trauma-informed care, it is not how it is not what you ask; it is how you ask the questions. And you know, so instead of saying to an individual, 
what happened to you, or instead of saying to an individual, what is wrong with you? We want to say to individuals, what happened to you? You know, tell me about your story. Tell me your narrative. I'm invested in who you are as a person because you might be the one person, the only person that's ever taken the time to ask. And I do, we do have a whole series of um, potential questions that we can ask individuals and all of which are survivor informed, both sex and labor trafficking, um, to try to help meet these individuals where they are at. But if there's anything that anyone can take away, from this video or from this interview, it is that we have to get back to the very basics of why we were called to care. And um, Jean Watson is one of my most favorite nursing theorists. She is um, my hero in nursing. And one of the things um, that she states is um, because she 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 actually coined the um, the the nursing caring theory for which is the foundation for all of our nursing practices. And one of the things that she states is maybe this one moment with this one person is the very reason that we were placed here on earth. And when you take a moment to really think about that, maybe this one moment, this one person is the reason why we're here on earth. How are you going to navigate that moment? And that's something that I, I, I challenge healthcare providers to think about. You know, we, we can perform CPR and we can bring someone back, right? I can save your life, but what is the life I'm bringing you back to? And part of the reason why I became so incredibly passionate about human trafficking was that when I first became a nurse, I wanted to help save lives. But it's through the work that I've been doing with human trafficking that I've learned it's not just about saving a life, it's about saving a person. And, and maybe, you know, maybe this person isn't ready to be saved today and that's okay. But we need to be consistent in every single interaction that we have with people, meeting both their cultural and gender needs, being compassionate, being caring, being kind, being considerate, and showing that we are invested in who they are, not only as our patient, but as a person. Thank you. Thank you for educating us, Dr. Lara. Uh, Mr. Harold D'Souza, I would to like to ask you this question that uh, you have been continuously tra traveling across the US and across the globe. You have been meeting the victims of human trafficking, the survivors, and also the legal authorities and everyone. Do you feel any change in the US government or in the India government or globally that uh, which the tactics or any set of rules they are following to combat the human trafficking? Are there any changes now? Is there any development globally? I think there is a lot of pro progress happening every second, every minute. Right now it is happening here on this uh, uh, virtual platform, uh, which Dr. Lara is doing and what you're doing, Riday. That's number one. But before I jump to that answer, I just want to tell all my audience in the United States of America and globally also, is that please note the number of national human trafficking hotline on your cell phones. So if you are a victim of labor trafficking or sex trafficking, or if you sus suspect somebody is a victim, please dial 1-888-888. 373-7888. So that's the number, you know. So that can save somebody's life. And in case you are, if you are in any trouble and in case you need any guidance to be nav navigated to a safety, please email at info, I-N-F-O at eyesopeninternational.org. Coming to the answer, uh, Riday, that there's a lot of changes that is happening, but a lot of changes needs to be done. We cannot always leave it to the Indian government or to the US government, because I always feel that you and we, we are the government. We are the people. It is we who have to change. The government will put all the rules and regulations, but we got to practice it. Like what Dr. Lara said, you know, I, I really liked it. You know, that when any patient comes, we got to look at them. And again, look at them and see what you don't see, because we always just look, them, look at them as a patient. But there is something much beneath that patient. That patient could be a victim of labor trafficking or sex trafficking or of any other crime. 
and i like that word which you use you know that you are not you are trying to save one life maybe from a cpr but you want to save that person you know you might save that life but that person is again back into his trafficking situation and that is what that is what really reflected about my situation <laughs> when i was in the hospital on the death bed right they put nine units of blood on me and i was gone okay i i i got saved you know physically but not from my trafficking situation okay that time they could not identify my case so this is very powerful so but i think there's a lot of changes happening rede today what you are doing in india as a regional director right and there are so many people you are educating and we can see the difference but it's a slow process but it is happening but until and unless we as a community members all country people get together and decide that we will always respect human beings the human rights many people even people like me who was educated i didn't know the human rights of the united nations the 30 human rights so many people are not aware of their human rights the freedom of speech the freedom of life freedom of choice and this we have to even encourage and give to them many times we say no you cannot do this we tell our own kids so it starts from the house and then within our community members and within our society so in my case also it was the church the sikamore school district and all the community members who helped me and i really respect them and again coming to the point it is the community today who can change the outcome to combat human trafficking globally yeah thank you thank you so before we wind up for the day dr lara is there any special message you want to give to our audience about human trafficking and about anything you wish to know to our audience Yeah, thank you so much. And it's so funny because I I feel like Carol and I we 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 have this connection with one another and somehow we we serve as a catalyst for going into our next thoughts and and um what he just said really inspired me to want to talk about one other thing that I do um really stress in the education that I provide to not only healthcare for members, you know, uh, and not only members of our healthcare community but um but when i go to provide education to them one of the things that i say to them is if even if i don't appeal to you today as a healthcare provider it is my sincere hope that i appeal to you today as a parent as a grandmother grandfather aunt uncle sibling um because you know when we talk about human trafficking and how it occurs remember i said that it it baffles me that we live in the united states the land of the free but yet we have people who are enslaved that we are seeing daily and not recognizing one of the things that that Harold just touched on was the fact that um people don't realize that there's the freedom of choice and when you take something like that and then you couple it with the issues of previous trauma low self esteem um lack of feeling worthy and then someone comes in and they provide all of these false promises of either employment or a better life or they they show love and compassion that maybe you've never experienced before or they work on your self esteem you know when you come from a really low place or they're just meeting those basic physiological needs of you need a place to stay you need food or shelter i'm here for you you know when we talk about human trafficking, trafficking we talk about that it occurs through force fraud and coercion but one of the things that we're not talking enough about is the grooming process and that is the process where you know um individuals are pulled into this life because they are actually led to believe that this individual cares for them and is going to make their life better and so um you know we really need that education piece in our communities we need that education piece um in in our schools in our healthcare systems it's it's not just one organization you know i say it many times that the healthcare providers can be that very first maybe frontline and identification because we have been trained to assess people from their head all the way to their to their toes and it's our job to look at people um in that way but we also have a role not only in the assessment and identification but we have a role in the prevention 
And so, you know, we really want to make sure that we're providing education out in the community, um, you know, empowering our children to have high self-esteem, to feel valued and to feel as though they are worthy and to teach them about you know, the signs of healthy relationships. What does a healthy relationship look like? You know, teach them empowerment and 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 teach them that, you know, we, we talk about the American dream, right? Um, we say that, you know, everybody has the potential to be something. We need to be telling this to our kids. So that way, you know, not only are we trying to combat human trafficking, but at the same time, we're trying to prevent it as well. And so, um, you know, whether you're listening to this presentation today as a healthcare provider or you're listening to this presentation today as a community member, a teacher, an advocate, a social worker, a mental health worker, every single one of us plays a unique role in both the identification, which Harold did an excellent job of sharing the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, but also the prevention. And if you aren't aware, I strongly encourage you to become aware. And I also encourage you to support organizations like um, Eyes Open International. You know, one of the beautiful things about Harold and myself um, that I, I truly believe is that this work that we do is 100% for the people. You know, I, all of the education that I provide and I and the places that I go and even the work I'm doing right now with the healthcare organization, it is all volunteer. And everything that Harold um, receives through Eyes Open International, it goes directly back to the, the individuals, to the victims and the survivors. And so I really encourage you to make yourselves aware. I encourage you to check out um, Eyes Open International and other organizations, definitely the National Human Trafficking Hotline. There's a ton of resources there. Um, and know that, you know, we may not be able to change the world, but we have the potential to change the world for one person. And so that is my takeaway. And to never underestimate the power of a planted seed. Very well said. Mr. D'Souza, any last message for our audience? Yeah, I just uh, want uh, the audience to know Riday is going to visit the United States of America in December. And uh, I want Riday also to share the uh, hotline number of India to our audience since you're on the show today, Riday and the email ID. And I want you to talk about the Cloudy Nivas because I think when he's going to come to the United States of America, he's going to create a lot of awareness and uh, prevention. And he'll be going back with a lot of empowerment. And the most important factor during uh, Riday's visit to the United States of America in the month of December is that uh, Eyes Open International is collaborating with SAFE uh, CHR, that is Coalition on Human Rights. And we are uh, very close to opening a male shelter home in the United States of America. Yeah. And this will be very beneficial, especially for victims of labor trafficking and for foreign nationals and, of course, for American citizens. So I will not take much time, but uh, I always wanted to add one thing, one note to all the community members like, you know, what we can do. I always say that, you know, look, listen, learn, love, live, and laugh with everyone, including the victims, survivors, and all the vulnerable populations. So thank you very much. But Riday, I want you to end with this about your visit to the United States of America and about Cloudy Nivas, like uh, what Eyes Open International is doing and what the sisters are doing uh, with those girls. Thank you. So talking about Eyes Open International, so we always believe in collaboration. So when a victim comes to us, so in the first case, we have developed our collaboration with more than dozens of NGOs in India. We have developed, uh, we have collaborated with the healthcare professionals. We have developed, we have collaborated with legal professionals. We have collaborated with shelter homes. So, Cloud in Nivas, Cloud in Nivas is an NGO. We have collaborated with Cloud in Nivas. What Cloud in Nivas do? They pick up girls, small girls uh, under the age of 18 and slightly above 20 or 22. They pick these girls from railway stations, bus stands, and other prone areas where these girls have been sexually assaulted and they are the potential victims of sex trafficking. They 
took these girls from these areas and they take these girls to their shelter homes. There they have school in their campus, an official school. So they try to provide them education. They give them food, cl uh, shelter, clothing, and also uh, they took care of the girls. And after they also try to marry these girls, irrespective of the religion. If a girl is Hindu, she she is being married to a Hindu girl. If a girl is Christian or Muslim, she is being married to a Muslim or Christian boy according to her wish. So this is how they operate. Also, they try to provide these girls the employment. They have been collaborated with many corporates over here. So uh, uh, within a couple of months, uh, within few months back, we have done a CSR activity for Cloud in US. We have collaborated with Inox CBA India, where Inox CBA India has built uh, six washrooms and washrooms for these girls. And also there are many projects for, for the Cloud in US, which we have collaborated with many corporates and we are doing with Cloud in US. Uh, also, Eyes Open International is working to start a human trafficking hotline number like which you have in US. Same, likewise, we are planning to start a human trafficking hotline number and also a human trafficking advisory council led by survivor. In India, there is not such a council led by any survivor, but we really believe in Obama's uh, respected Obama's dream that he has uh, appointed the survivors in White House and like that only we are planning to have council in india as well and talking about united states so there are many events which we have organized in december january february about awareness also we are opening a milk shelter home uh, many of the human trafficking uh, advocates are talking about sex trafficking labor trafficking uh, many weightage has been given to women so that's a very good thing but no one is speaking about men also, man himself doesn't speak about himself. He feels shy that yes, I am a man. If I speak about myself, my if I speak about my lows, then what will people think of me? And he doesn't share his things. So we are specially concentrating on male victims, and we are opening a shelter home in USA. And also, there are many projects to do. So Eyes Open International, you can see in five years that Eyes Open International will be uh, globally. Uh, right now, we are in India. We are very active in India. We are very active in Canada. We are very active in USA. Also, we are uh, uh, appointing a regional director in Ghana, in South Africa. So, in Africa, like that, we have many projects on hands. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, to our viewers that the girls, what uh, Riday was talking, Cloud University is run by the sisters of Convent of Jesus and Mary. So, they pick up girls from the age group of 6 to 18 years old. And the cost of one girl for lodging, boarding, medical, all expenses is just 15,000 rupees per year. That is like $200. So Eyes Open International has sponsored a lot of girls with the support of all our community members. So if anyone is willing to sponsor even one child in the United States of America, you know, they can contact Dr. Lara or they can contact me or they can go to Eyes Open International. So $200. So even if you... Save, say, $5, like not going to Starbucks, you know. I'm not trying to, like, you know, Starbucks is a good place I go. So, but that, like, $200 will save the life of one girl for one year. And that means a lot. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Riday. And thank, thank you, Dr. Dr. Before, before we Before we go, can I add one other thing? Yes. Again, that catalyst of inspiring me to, to want to, to say a little bit more. You know, we there's so much that we could talk about about human trafficking. We could go on and on and on. But one of the things that 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 just inspired me to to speak out about this is, is that I'm really thankful that you mentioned that men and boys are victims just as much as girls and women are, and that we need to be aware that that these individuals are high risk as well, because um, I don't know that we talk enough about that. And the other thing that I want to, to conclude with too, that's a message specifically to our healthcare community, is that when we do encounter an individual in the clinical setting, we need to make sure that we are following our policies and protocols. And if we don't have policies and protocols in place, then I strongly encourage you to want to adapt those. Um, 
Currently, right now, we are working um, with the Ohio Attorney General's Office on a Human Trafficking Healthcare Subcommittee, for which we are creating a template that will be available for hospitals to use um, in the future on um, creating policies for your organization. But please always remember that if you encounter an individual who is a minor, you are, or of a vulnerable population, you are required to follow your mandated protocol calls. So, you know, if this is individual as a minor, then we want to involve children's services and we need to make sure that we're reporting what is reportable and that we are doing what we can to meet these individuals' needs. And again, remembering that human trafficking can happen to anyone, both um, women and girls, as well as men and boys. And I really think, you know, Harold brought up a really good point about advocacy for these groups. You know, we, we do, we spend a lot of money on unnecessary things. And if we can spend just $200 to, to, to help an individual or to save an individual, I mean, why, why wouldn't we? So please, please, please make yourselves informed, learn everything that you can, investigate um, what's available in your community to, to be an advocate, and definitely research Eyes Open International. And if you're a healthcare provider, um, look to see what your healthcare organization is doing to, for their part to combat human trafficking. Thank you, Dr. Lara. Thank you, Arul sir. Meeting you again with a good and a very innovative topic. Till then, see you. Take care. This is Bharat FM. Bajega Bharat, Jhumega Bharat.